Welcome to the Voices of Manufacturing with your hosts, Brian Salee and Michael Mullenberg, where business leaders across the industry share their unique challenges and insights. It's almost like magic because it takes the learning process sometimes from weeks down to days, sometimes hours. We want to help people within manufacturing and make them excited to come to work every day and go home safe to their family. When you bring people in, they're anything but a machine. They're partners uh, that can help you build your business, that can be your success if you treat them right. And then you start having employees saying, when are you doing my machine? When are you going to come over here to my department? And now you get this buy-in. This podcast is brought to you by Dazuki, the premier frontline digital transformation solution that allows manufacturers to standardize operations. Welcome to the Voices of Manufacturing podcast. I'm joined today by my co-host, Michael Molenberg. Michael, we've, we've got a great guest and topic today. We're, we're speaking with Vitaly. Potopenko from Solar Plastics. I met Vitaly recently and he shared a story about how his company was able to increase production through nearshoring. And I know this is a, a hot topic right now in manufacturing, nearshoring and reshoring. And so it really caught my attention. Vitaly, welcome, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure. Well, Vitaly, you know, first thing I like to ask guests, what's your role at Solar Plastics? And tell us a little about the company. What do you guys do? My name is Rowe at the Solar Plastic. I am a production manager and I am responsible for daily production activities as well as the engineering department and training. You're handling not only production, but also the training side of things as well. Yeah, we are auto molding facilities. So the product that we are making, most of it is the plastic uh, component. And we have a variety of customers from Polaris and Yeti and some other customers as well. Great. And you guys, I believe, are you headquartered in, in the Minneapolis area? Is that right? Yes, that is correct. We are located in the Delano, uh, Delano Minneapolis, Fin City area. Excellent. Well, well, tell us a little bit more. You guys recently started up a factory in, in Mexico. And I'm, I'm curious, what caused you guys to, to think, hey, we should expand and let's add a factory in Mexico versus, you know, obviously doing it in the U.S. or maybe outsourcing all the way to China or some other country? We had some challenges here in the U.S., especially when the COVID started. We've seen that a lot of people have been getting sick and uh, it was difficult to find the labor. And also the increased cost uh, of the labor also was uh, impacting and the uh, supplier demand growth significantly and the customer demand growth significantly as well. As a result, we are thinking about different opportunities where we can move the plant and the uh, Management the company owners had the experience running up having a plant in Mexico and as well as the VP of operation also she's originally from Mexico and he used to work there and run a plant. So he had the, he had connections there and uh, also under, understand the structure of the business in Mexico. And at the end, uh, after review review on all different options, the organization decided the Mexico would be a best choice for that. Vitaly, where are your other locations? across, uh, across your businesses. Yeah, we are a kind of a location in the Delano, Delano, Iowa and the Mexico, Monterey and the Devonport. So three different locations. Three locations. I think that's really interesting. The, the owners already had experience with starting production in Mexico. They had previously done that with, was it with another company or with, with your company? Is this the second factory in Mexico? No, uh, the VP of operation had, was running a plant in Mexico, which was also producing the auto molding component. And uh, after he moved to US and started running a plant here, he eventually had a, he eventually had the connections with the land manager who used to run it, the plant in, Mex in Mexico, and uh, they offered him that opportunity, and he was willing to accept it. This core new opportunity that we uh, to open a new plant and establish it. So you had to, you actually moved some employees from the U.S. down to that plant in Mexico. Was that a short-term term move or are they there long-term? We actually moved the employees to Mexico because they're in a training. So when we start hiring an employee in Mexico, and one, one of the challenge was to train those employees. And since we had already established the training program here, and that was showing a good result in terms of the efficiency in, uh, increase and the quality reduction, we decided to use the opportunity to bring the employees from U.S. as the trainers to provide a training to the employees in Mexico. 
Vitaly, was, was the growth that you were seeing, was it with existing products or were you actually expanding your portfolio with new products as well during this time? It, it was the existing product. So we been running out of the capacity at our plant and also the cost challenges, like I mentioned with the late and labor shortage. So, which was bringing us to the, asking the questions, what are the other opportunities? And, uh, the Mexico was one of the, one of the opportunities to, to run a plan there. Yeah. So your existing employees and your trainers had some experience with these processes and with these products. Uh, correct. So we've been, uh, we've been already, we had already established training here in Delano and the uh, employees already, you helped run this, uh, this product and it was a good, uh, and pretty much the, we decided to bring them there to share that knowledge with, uh, with the employees in Mexico. Yeah. And I think Vitaly, you had mentioned to me, the, the plant, you guys were actually ahead of schedule. What was it like four or five weeks ahead of schedule in terms of getting the new plant started? Is that right? It is correct. So pretty much we went uh, about five weeks ahead of the, for the production schedule and ramping up. And uh, one of the, the biggest success of that was that we had a management quality, had a background in the rotor molding as well as uh, bringing employees who already done the product before and were able to teach the others, help, help uh, ramp up plant to be a five, five weeks ahead of schedule. That's amazing. Yeah. You don't usually hear of projects like that. It, it sounds like the experience of the team really, really helped out there, but I'm, I'm really interested in the training program. You mentioned you guys had a training program. It sounds like a pretty robust training program already with your factories in the U S yeah. and is that one of the key factors or elements that helped you guys be successful with starting that factory in, in Mexico is that training program? Yes, Brian, I would say that was one of the key factors because no one having an employee who already can produce the product and be able to teach the other employees, obviously increase that ramp up time and considering if we didn't have any knowledge and couldn't share that knowledge with the plant outside of the country. What, what does the training cycle look like for a new employee in roto molding? I'm not super familiar with that technology. It sounds very complex. Is it days or weeks or months? Yeah, I can cover some, uh, get some details on that. So here, the, what, what's happening, we have a onboarding program, uh, which is usually last about one day. So we take an operator and in a room and uh, we're having a PowerPoint presentation and discussing about what the organization is, what the safety policies are and the terminology about how we, how, what kind of terminology we use in, in the type of the company. So when employees go on the floor, we use. The language when they hear and people using it, they know what this means and they can interpret it, that language. And the next step is, I mean, after we complete that uh, training for that in the first day, if we still have some time, we bring those employees into the, what we call the training cell. This is the cell that's specifically designed for our new operators. And in that cell, we review on the work instructions, the process standards work. And the activities, what they go on to do within one week of training at that cell. So would, after we complete that, the next Vitaly, day. Could we, could we dig in there? I, I haven't heard of that before. So you actually have a training cell where employees will go and really practice some of the processes with the guidance of the instructor. Is that right? Yeah, it is correct. This is a, like I mentioned, the initial step is review the process. And the next day when they come in to the, to work, this is when the, we have a train instructors who are working with those employees and, uh, walking through the step, uh, to first recovering the standard work, making sure that they were able to follow it with a instructor guidance. And after that, we watching them and making, and then anyway, making sure that they are able to do it independently before they go on the floor, just something to keep in mind. I mean, what. Not our goal is not to make sure they meet in a cycle, a cycle of the time of the process. Our goal is making sure that they do in a quality job, they train to the same standard and also get that knowledge in the comfortable environment without feeling the pressure of the, of the, of the factory, factory speed. I, I want to hit on something you just said there. The focus is on quality and not speed. And I think that's really important. This type of view of training that your company has, right? It, you're investing in the employee, you have instructors that are training them, you have a training cell. Was this something the company has always, is this how the company has always operated and, and you guys have had this robust training program or is this something that's been developed as a result of some of the challenges from the pandemic 
when that, you know, labor shortage, skill shortage that we've been talking about? It's a combination. First thing, like you mentioned, was the pandemic and we started seeing a higher number of turnover. And we had a challenge how to train those employees in a short amount of time without losing the efficiency and the impact and the quality of the product. And the most importantly, safety too. The thorough molding is the quite physical labor and the, to know and what, to follow in the process correctly is very critical because it's kind of a combination of the art and the process. So, uh, we've been, we've been asking the question, how we can deal with those challenges and, uh, the solution was uh, making a training cell. And also when the, I came from, when I started working here, they already had the ideas about how the training cell going to look like, but also my knowledge from working from Polaris and Caterpillar, it's one of the things what I, we, they held all in common. They had the training cells and by working with, by being part of this new development, help us, help us to establish the training process. Yeah, I really like how you've separated the onboarding, as you mentioned, you know, the safety, the culture, the language. And then, and then you move them into this work cell where they can do this hands-on, very practical, again, focused on quality. I really, I really like that. What are some of the other elements of the, of the onboarding piece? Do you talk about your company culture and, and things even beyond the language of manufacturing? Once the onboarding is finished in the training cell, we take an operators and introduce them to the team. That's the, one of the aspects, once we introduce them to the team on the floor, we also have the assemblers who've been qualified to be trainers. They're not like actual trainers one-on-one, -on -one, but this is the people who on the assembly who have a good attitude and like who, who, who consistently showing the quality work and be able to meet the production standards. So we bring in those employees to the people on the floor and they and assign them to work with them for within one week to six, seven weeks, depending on the type of the job, because each job requiring different amount of training. So that's uh, what we define it on the, on the, once the employee moves to the floor, on the floor, not each operator completing, uh, finishing the training at the same time. We can have it, operators can be ready within uh, two weeks, depending on the job. Some operators will be ready within the seven to eight weeks. Now let's, let's dig in there a little bit further, Vitaly, because I think that's another interesting element in your training program. You've got experienced operators, but it's not just experience that qualifies them to work with a new operator. You mentioned attitude as well. So you're looking for operators who are willing and want to help out and want to train these new operators. Is that, is that part of the evaluation criteria there? Correct. We have an evaluation checklist that type for people want to be certified to train others. I mean, we have an incentive, we're paying them a little bit of extra for doing that. So that way they are available and showing an interest. But in order to qualify, we have a couple of criteria that we review on it. Like I said, it should be a quality standard cycle time. And I always teach the supervisors about before we qual qualify on somebody, let's just look at their personalities. I mean, not everybody wants to be a trainer. And there is a people uh, and not everybody want to do the different job all the time, which is training requiring tra uh, involved with the different people and different activities. So by able to identify those uh, personalities, for example, we're looking for a person who always moving around, who likes recognition, who, who willing to connect with others. And once we identify that person, we can ask, we approach him and ask him if they would be interested to be a part of the training team. But personality is one of the most important because if you think about, we're taking a person from the outside, they're bringing into the factory, the first, first exposure, what they get into, they get into the person that they never knew. And within those two weeks, they develop in the impression about the culture and, and that impression going to stay with them for the long time. So just not only to know how to do the job, but to actually introduce it to the culture of the company in more manageable way, it will help the employee faster adapt to their, to their organization. Yeah. I like that. You're, you're looking for these superstar personalities that have both the, you know, the gift of the training but the personality as well. Do you see that that also maybe affects your, uh, your employment loyalty? If they like their trainer, they're more likely to want to work, work in that environment. Yes. And we also given the opportunity, uh, we given it to the new employees opportunity, not only to stay with the company, but also give them opportunity to grow because like all of us, all of us want to advance in a career and not only financially, but also dealing with the different challenges. So as a result of that, we developed the, 
roadmap, employee de development roadmap, which we shared with the employee, posted, print out and posted on the production floor. And each employee, if they're interested in advancing those specific roles, either it's a trainer or any other employees, they can, they know exactly criteria what we're looking for. And uh, we'll be able to ap approach the HR and work on a process to advance in those roles. And if they missing some of those skills, we can communicate to them what they need to accomplish in order to be qualified for that job and they can work over to that as well. Wow. I'm impressed with this training program and your understanding of people and what motivates people. This idea that you guys have a roadmap, but then you make it visible. You actually put the career roadmap on, did you say posters? They're actually posters within the factory? Yep. We have uh, five posters in the different locations and we selected the area when we have a most traffic of the employee traffic, like by the clock, by the entering doors, so they can constantly see it because if we communicate to them, we have opportunity to grow. I mean, since we have any new employees, sometimes we will forget eventually, but by having the posters and have it constantly in the front of them, they'll kind of, if people want to grow, they will ask asking themselves, hey, I have opportunity what I'm doing to advance in, in this role, in those roles. Yeah, that's a really good point. You're, by having those posters up, you're constantly reminding them that it's, right. it's their decision then, right? That yep. if they want to develop, it's up to them to, to choose that path. Yes. And uh, currently this month, we're working on the program with HR. We're going to have a sign up list for each employee. That employee, if they will learn to advance in their career, that they can go talk to myself and the HR manager and share why they want to grow in that career, what kind of, what kind of skills they think they have. And also we can tell them if they qualify, what the process should be. And uh, if they miss some of those skills, we can kind of guide them, define a timeline so that they can work towards those skills and then pretty much have a follow-up meeting with them after or help them out to walk through a process. So HR is very involved in the process then in terms of the employee development and this advancing their skills. Correct. Yeah, we have, uh, it's, we, we went working with HR and to develop this uh, roadmap and then we've been developing it with implemented in other facilities as well, to have the same communication and same standards between the plan. That's really interesting to hear the role HR is playing. And Michael, you know better than I do, but oftentimes I see HR mostly focused on compliance training and not actual making sure the employee knows how to do their job well and what skills they need to advance in the company. That's, that's not often a major focus for HR. Yeah. It sounds like a great partnership with the trainers, the people developing and doing the work and as well as HR helping manage the career path and advising. It sounds like a really good partnership. Yeah. I mean, it's that. Yeah. Definitely to have a great support in all the areas of organiza an organization to make it successful is critical because everybody, needs to, each, each department needs to be responsible for their own activities and have a follow-up on it. Vitaly, I want to go back because, you know, there's something, Michael, you, you always say this, the best operators are too busy doing their jobs to train other people, which I think most companies would totally agree with. You don't want to take your best operators away from the work that they're doing because they're oftentimes your most profitable and productive employees. And so Vitaly, you guys have done that though. I don't know how much of an impact or by these experienced operators training these new operators, how much of an impact that's having on their productivity. But what was the, the thought process there saying, Hey, we have to have experienced operators train these new ones versus continuing on with instructor led training and just allowing instructors to train. Was there a, a gap in knowledge from the instructors and that just was it going to be possible? Just to have an instructor by himself training it, it's not enough time for the operator to remember all the steps, what they train them within a week. And also people need to have a reminder about the steps and something to remember when they go on the production floor, they not meeting the, the cycle times at that time. So they kind of creating a bottleneck on the production line. And that was the thought, thought behind it. Let's take it, assign them to the experienced operators that they can help them and take that pressure off of the, their shoulders. And we also had a few, few floating positions as well. So pretty much the people can cover the different areas, but when we need to train them, if the trader is busy training a new employee, the floater can cover it for the role. Is there an impact on, you mentioned already, cycle time might be, is the cycle time slowed down potentially? when an experienced operator is training a new operator? Is that, is that an expectation that you're just not going to work as fast because you might be 
answering questions or trying to show them a technique or particular elements of the process? Actually, we did. That's one of the interesting factors that we didn't notice the major impact on the cycle time because they, I mean, you don't have to explain the process itself to the new operators when they, they are on the line because they're already familiar with the process. So you save when the time already there to walk into the work instruction and they explain the documentation because when they go there, they pretty much ready to go to do the, do the work. And the person who has to assign to them, just making sure that they're watching them, that they are doing all the steps. And at that point, when the speed, uh, speed becomes the important as well, we have a, somebody assigned to them, making sure that they not rush it through and uh, completing all the steps. Well, yeah, it's just a new way to think about job shadowing. I think this is, you know, as for our audience here, one, you guys have this onboarding program where you spend time, like you said, covering the company culture, safety, things like that. You have a training cell and then you have what I would call advanced job shadowing. Really, this isn't just job shadowing where you're going to go stand next to an experienced operator. You guys are actually qualifying these experienced operators, making sure that they actually want to train. And then you're giving them the room to actually do that training, work with those, those new operators. Where, where does it go from there? I know, Michael, you were talking about this earlier, but what's, how do you emphasize or reinforce training over time when maybe it's been a little while before you've done a process or maybe you forgot how to do something? How do you reinforce that training? Yeah, there is a couple of steps that are happening between the training with a, with a certified trainer and the assembly training. First one is that we want to make sure that we complete in the trainer documentation. So there's a training checklist, which they need to complete. And we not only asking them to review all those criteria, but also trainer, the new employees find it and verifying that they complete the training, they initial it. And they say, if they have any questions, this is a good opportunity to ask it and we can clarify it. The second phase, when they go to the production floor, there is another document, the qualification document, which is based on the safety cycle time and the uh, safety cycle time and the quality as well. And based on those criteria, if they pass uh, the, all the criteria that we consider in the employee fully trained. And on the training metrics, we have four different criteria how we document it. First one is the new, first quadrant is the new employee. Second quadrant is the employee that received some training, but not able to follow the cycle time. Third one is that employee able to perform the job independently. And the first one is that employee who will be qualified to train the others. It doesn't mean necessarily that they are qualified, or they are, will be training the others. It means they are qualified and they can apply for their role. They can apply for it. And the next, after we complete all this, employee already on the floor, then we also have the process that we reinsure that the, the process actually follows. What we're using for that, the standard work audit. So the quality team lead and supervisor requiring to complete one standard work audit per shift. And it's based on the, on the quality criteria. If we see in the highest increase in quality, then we asking them to uh, do a standard work audit in that particular area. Because first thing, the question is, did everybody follow the process? This process is a problem before you start changing anything. And then if they follow the process, then we go into the investigation of the root cause of the problem related to the process. So by, by collecting the documents, we know that uh, the, op the operators follow in the process and we have actually documentation to review it. And based on that, making the changes in the process if we need to. Because if operator follow in the process and we constantly have any issues, we can use the, those audits of the discussion to if we need to change something in the standards work, make it more clear or maybe change the step. And this is always my favorite part is the improvement cycle. So you're using those audits to identify opportunities and then rapidly updating the, the documentation, the training. Are there any, any other tips or techniques for generating those improvement ideas or realizing that there might be a gap in the standard? Yes. One thing if uh, for anybody who, who working on implementation of this type of uh, training programs, I would say the critical aspect is uh, making sure that the trainers align with the supervisor's expectation. For in my mind, supervisor is the customer of the training. So if the trainer have a one opinion about the training. And then they give the, they bring a new employee to the supervisor and supervisor have a completely different opinion about the level of what the employee needs to be trained to. 
it's going to create a gap and that difficult to be to cover it. And even we, we think we're training an employee, but it's still the gap, the gap exists. So the critical part for it, it should be evaluation after training is completed, should be evaluation on the side of the supervisor to provide any feedback to a trainer to making sure that we continue improving the maybe communication, maybe skills of the trainers or the training program over, overall. Because uh, without that feedback, I mean, it's going to be a, be a significant gap. I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that the supervisor is the customer of the trainer. I, I think that's brilliant. That's a great attitude. And then they, they provide the feedback to the training system to improve the whole system, not just the specific document. Yeah, in, in my mind, when I see it, when the student go to the college and they receive a degree and they, they, they finish the class at the end of it, it's, the evaluation is completed. So they provide a feedback to the professor. I mean, that's, that's the same thing. The, the trainer and the trainee, it's a student and a teacher. And once they complete that evaluation, somebody needs to evaluate how, we, how successful we are in this criteria. Yeah. Well, Vitaly, I want to go back to something because I think this is really one of the most maybe overlooked tools, lean tools in manufacturing, and that's a standard work audit. And, you know, because oftentimes you get drift from the standard over time, right? You train somebody to the standard, they know how to do it. And then over time, they start to come up with shortcuts. It's just a natural tendency is to find what's the way I can do this quicker. Um, you know, what's the way that I like doing it? And so the standard work audit was really important. We see it a lot in automotive and making sure that people are following that standard. H how do you make the employee not feel though, like they're being, you know, the word audit, right? I think the word audit can come across as like, I'm in trouble. Like I didn't do something right. So how do you make the employee not feel defensive? Uh, one thing when I'm, with, when I'm working with the supervisors, I ask them to focus on the people personalities. So I. Ask the supervisor to complete the personality test, this personality test to know who they are in terms of the director, uh, entertainer, thinker, or, or connector. So it was interesting because I asked him to complete the, this test and then I asked him to, to actually listen to the training and then to match the test to the training material, what they listen and make it, making sure that they actually see a value in it. So by seeing that the test is actually working and the personalities uh, are different, uh, I ask him to apply that knowledge with the employees as well. So when they go talk to the employee and uh, they take in a different approach to a different, uh, to the different employees, like we hear over and over again, we need to treat everybody differently. Everybody's same, but really. I mean, we're all the same. I mean, with some of us are best thinkers, some of us are entertainers. We're not the same and that we all of us need a different approach based on the other personalities. So by training the employee supervisors to those personalities, we'll be able to identify the employees. So for example, if employee is a thinker, we need to explain them why we're doing it and like, give them more detail. If the person is more detail, goal, goal oriented, we can tell them, well, I mean, this specific is going to help us improve the quality, efficiency, so on and so forth. So by, by finding the, what driving, the, the values for driving that employee to communicate it to the employees, this is, I believe it's the key. What, what type of tool to use or evaluation do you use to, to capture that personality difference in your employees? We use the DISC personality to, uh, this personality test to uh, teach the uh, supervisors on the criteria. That's a key that uh, we cannot test everybody, but the, by making the supervisors be aware about those type of personality differences, that's going to make it more effective because at the, at the end, the leaders will, will communicate directly to the employees all the time. So by applying the DISC personalities and using the uh, material, what we call the relationship strategies. It's a, what, one of the book that was published, it describes not only how to identify the personalities, but also how to communicate effectively to those type of personalities to how they call them the golden rule, communicate the way how the person want to be communicated versus the old one communication style. So you've taken the whole, the old fashioned Myers-Briggs thing to a whole nother level. Sounds, sounds really Correct. good. Like it. Yeah. And also we providing a training to the supervisors as well. In terms of leadership development, which is helping uh, supervisors to communicate to the employee and convince them about the process audit. But again, it will be a different approach for everybody. We cannot say it's just a cookie cutter for everyone. It needs to be based on the personalities and, and their work style. 
Well, Vitaly, this is truly a, a really impressive training program that you guys have established. I'm, I'm just blown away from new employee onboarding to reinforcing standards as they continue to develop as an employee to giving them a roadmap and how they can, can grow in the company. It seems like you guys are doing a lot of the right things, especially in this day and age where you really got to engage employees to, to keep them around. I'm curious now, I want to transition the conversation. You guys started this plant in Mexico. You were ahead of schedule. You've got this great training program to bring people up to speed. Obviously, working with folks in Mexico is going to be different than working with folks here in the United States. There's going to be a little bit of a language barrier, I imagine. How did you guys overcome that? Did you have folks who were bilingual and spoke both English and Spanish? Or what were the ways that you were able to develop this workforce down there? Yes. So one of the things, a couple of things, how we overcome this. First one, we brought, when we hired the employees in the leadership role, like quality, production management, engineers, we brought them, he brought them here to U.S. and they spent some time here to learn about the products and about the processes. And uh, quite a few of them went English speaking. And uh, once they learned the process, then they went back to Mexico plant and uh, start working on establishing the processes there. So the second phase was hire, when we hire new employees, we had a couple, a couple of things that play a critical role in the training process was the clear work instructions and that work. So by having those documents available here, we were easily translate, we were able easily to translate those documents into the Spanish. And in addition to it, we made the videos of the processes as well. So you have three documents, you can have a videos, standard work and the work instructions. So we. We share that information with the uh, Mexico team. And in addition to it, by sending the experienced trainers and employees to Mexico to be able to explain it and walk into the process, it was much easier because A, they already knew the cover of what the process looks like, and B, we just need to have somebody there to guide them through the process and correct some of the imperfections, I'll say. I think that I'm, I'm hearing a lot more, especially with the, the challenges of recruiting and, and filling open roles is now you're starting to, to branch out and hire folks who maybe aren't going to speak English in your factory. I know several companies that we work with have a workforce that they've got to support five different languages and there's just no way they're going to translate the work instructions into those five languages, especially when you start making updates. And so what you mentioned there, videos, it sounds like that played a really key role in being able to transfer some of that knowledge from the folks here in the U.S., the folks down in, in Mexico. Correct. Yes, you're correct. The video and, and was a critical part. Yeah. I know, my, Michael, you've had a lot of experience using video for work instructions as well. I'm, I'm curious, you know, from, from your experience, you know, what makes a, a video work instruction, you know, more effective? And what are the times when you use a video work instruction versus just using photos? I think we, we often incorporated a video as just a brief overview, a flyover, if you will. We didn't have a lot of factories that had work centers that were set up specifically for training for people to practice. So we'd give a, a short video of the actual process that they'd be running. And then that was the first step of the training. And then they would get into the, the work breakdown structure, the, the specific job tasks before they got out on the line. Um, and I, I love your comment about the, the, the video, just showing the work doesn't require a lot of commentary. Uh, so it's, it's sort of language inert. Now your, your, your bullet points and your standard work documents, that's where the translation comes in. And that's pretty labor intensive to do that. But it sounds like you found a way to do that because you've got some bilingual people kind of built into your process. Might be a little harder if you had four more languages in there, like the example Brian mentioned. <laughs> Yeah, near, nearly impossible at that, that point. Google Google Translate, that's the answer there. Well, Vit Vitaly, this, is, this has been great. We're going to move towards wrapping up this conversation that's just been filled with so many great tips. I just, I think the audience is going to be blown away with how structured of a training program you guys have here. I'm curious though, you guys started this factory. How are things going? How's production going there compared to your factories here in the U.S.? It's, we've been for five, five weeks ahead of the schedule. And I mean, we we found some of the challenges like with, with the product, but like with any new, new startup, but overall, I mean, the management was happy with, a with a fake of the project was moving forward. You're critical to quality parameters are 
the quality checks, the dimensions, and then you mentioned cycle time. Is there a, is there a cost metric as well as part of this? It is, but I am, I'm not sure exactly how it's performing to Mexico. I mean, I know like when we implement the training program here, we were able to increase uh, the efficiency went up by 15%. And we also were able to reduce the quality defect by half. I mean, it's related to the training program, but as well as the other factors. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Vitaly, you did, you said you improved quality by, by half, by 50%? By 50%, yeah. With this training program and efficiency uh, went up 15%. I mean, it's not only, uh, it's not, uh, it, it started happening when we implement the training program, what was the other factors? I mean, we got the different leaders and on the production floor, we had some management change to super, supervision, but it was happening at the same time. So to, to tell it, if it's directly related to the training, I cannot say exactly how much was the percentage, but did the quality improve when we implemented? Yeah, it was improved by 50%. Yeah, that's impressive. Wow. Well, I think that makes a wrap guys. I think this has been a really great conversation, Vitaly. And like I said, our audience is going to gain a lot of great tactics that they can pull into their training program. I think what I appreciate about your training program is just an understanding of, of the employee and what motivates them, who they, who they are, how to communicate with them, which are often elements of a training program that are, that are overlooked people element. We're always so focused on the outcome being and how do we meet our production targets and quality targets, but you guys are really focused on the people as well, which in this day and age with the, the challenge of recruiting and filling these roles, I think everybody's got to move towards that type of focus. One thing I would say the important with this, any, like with this program or any program, I mean, if we start, if anybody starts doing it, I mean, they really need to believe that it's going to bring the value to the organization. There is potential there. And they can take, if they don't believe it, it's going to bring a value. They go on to take the results and after the, after two, three weeks, the program go on to die. So I would say people need to start first, have a commitment and have that vision and believe it's going to give them results and the results going to come to the outcome of the implementation. Great. Well, Vitaly, thank you for your time today. Michael and I enjoyed this conversation with you and again, appreciate the insights. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Voices of Manufacturing podcast with Brian Salee and Michael Mullenberg. This show is brought to you by Dazuki, the premier digital transformation solution that allows manufacturers to standardize operations. Our website, where you can listen to our episodes and find tons of helpful resources, is dazuki.com. Sign up for our monthly newsletter so you'll be the first to know about new episodes. That's dazuki.com and join us in creating the front line of the future.
Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Voices of Manufacturing podcast with Brian Salee and Michael Mullenberg. This show is brought to you by Dazuki, the premier digital transformation solution that allows manufacturers to standardize operations. Our website where you can listen to our episodes and find tons of helpful resources is dazuki.com. Sign up for our monthly newsletter so you'll be the first to know about new episodes. That's dazuki.com and join us in creating the front line of the future.